Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> well, we just prayed, Father, help us to understand the meaning of your son's death and resurrection and teach us to reflect on your lives. And it's uh, great to hear those prayers of the Lord Jesus in that last hour. Uh, today we come, uh, we're surely going to come to the final piece of Jesus' public teaching uh, in the lead up to uh, that moment in the garden. Uh, the last public teaching of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, uh, the last part of the last sermon Jesus publicly delivers in this Gospel. And where does Jesus uh, finish his public teaching? Well, it's with judgment, uh, a picture of the great separation of the sheep from the goats. Uh, we prayed in that prayer of the week, uh, teach us to reflect on our lives. Uh, it's going to come up, we're going to see how important that is because uh, we will all stand before a judge and the judge will separate us with the sheep and the goats to his right or to his left. Uh, that's where we're going today. But it's Jesus, God's King, uh, his death, uh, his wrath-bearing death that we heard being prayed about in the garden that holds the key to that judgment day. And for next week, we're going to uh, be getting into the events in and around his death. But I want you to just turn back uh, a little bit into chapter 25 of Matthew to verse 31 to hear this final part, portion of Jesus' uh, last public sermon in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come. You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Uh, sorry, I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord... When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Uh, it's interesting, actually, uh, when you see the end of this last public sermon, it's actually where Jesus finished his first public sermon, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, speaking of judgment, the great, final, unavoidable judgment. Uh, so we start with uh, judgment. It's a bit of a love-hate relationship that we have with judgment. On the one hand, we don't like talking about judgment, and other people don't like us talking about judgment, especially God's judgment, the final judgment to come. That's not the sort of polite dinner party conversation that's acceptable. And maybe uh, you get a little bit embarrassed by the Bible's teaching about judgment. Maybe you try and skate over it as quickly as possible to get back into speaking about nice things. 
Yet we and the people we know do have a longing for justice. There's a genuine longing for people to be treated fairly, that the good should be vindicated, that evil should be punished. It's like it's hardwired into us. Even children instinctively spot when something is unfair. They just get it and they complain instantly and incessantly. Um, as adults, as adults, we have systems. We create systems for judgment to be delivered. It might be a, an appeals process for, through school or the workplace or trial before the courts of the land. We want to be dealt with fairly and we want criminals to be brought to justice and face judgment especially uh, abusive and violent criminals and don't you have the same experience that you turn on the evening news and again you're confronted with the atrocities being committed through our world I thought uh, in terms of preparing and doing research for the sermon, I should put on the news one night this week. So Wednesday night, I stick it on. Where does it start? Biden and Putin uh, puffing their chests out and, and, uh, over nuclear weapons, with Putin blaming everyone else in the world for the Ukraine situation. That was followed up by uh, reports of the death of a 28-year-old man who'd been bashed to death, who had two guys stomping on his head on the ground to kill him because he'd so dared to sell one of them fake AirPods. Bring on justice. We don't want Putin and his cronies, those guys that stomped on a guy's head till he was dead, to get away with that. And I'm sure the people from ropes to the river, and in fact the people to the very ends of the earth, would agree we need justice. But let's go and speak with them about the judgment of God. And the mood will cool super quickly. <laughs> Which is why it's so significant that Jesus is so public about end time judgment. The world won't end with a nuclear holocaust, a climate catastrophe, even an extraterrestrial invasion. I'm not stay on track. Uh, the world will end with the great final judgment of God. A judgment delivered by Jesus himself, the Son of Man, which means it's absolutely critical that we understand how certain that judgment is, on what that judgment is based, and what is the outcome of that judgment. And so we're going to work through that in three points. The judge, the nature of judgment, and the outcome of the judgment. It's on the outline, if you've got an outline on the way in. Uh, they'll keep working. That We'll work their way through up on the screen as well. But we start with the judge. Who's the judge? Uh, start of the passage, it's the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a way that Jesus is referred to. So Jesus, the Son of Man, is the judge. And throughout uh, verses 31 to 46 of chapter 25, there's a whole lot of connections uh, leading back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament where it's full of promises of God that find their yes, find their fulfilment, their completion, their tying together in the Lord Jesus. And so Jesus himself, in what he does and in what, he's teach, what he teaches, makes that clear. And so back in Daniel chapter 7, God's prophet had been given a vision of what would happen at the end of the age. And what his vision has are thrones placed. The Ancient of Days, God taking his seat, the court sitting in judgment, the books were open. It's an extremely impressive scene. 10,000 times 10,000 standing before the throne. I was told how awesome and amazing the atmosphere was at an Ed Sheeran concert on Friday night. Uh, Ed Sheeran concert had 10,000 times 8.7 people standing around his stage. Not 10,000 times 8.7. Jesus has 10,000 times 10,000. Daniel continues in this way. In my vision, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, 
coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and he was led into his presence. The Son of Man was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, Daniel saw that vision in Babylon uh, six centuries before Jesus, and it is a picture of judgment, of God's purpose being put into effect in the world, who by? By the judge, the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus. And so Jesus picks up this image and points to its fulfilment in his own coming at the end. He will come in glory with the angels with him. He'll sit on his glorious throne. It will be a moment of monumental significance. Against the backdrop of injustice and disorder in our world, God has appointed his judge. His judge will take his place and he will enact his judgment. Jesus is the one to whom all authority is given. Jesus is the one who will make all the decisions on that day. Everything on the great day of judgment is centred upon him, Jesus, the Son of Man, the judge. Every judgment has reference to him, Jesus, the Son of Man, the judge. That's because he is the one God has given an everlasting dominion, an eternal kingdom to. He is the judge who is the king. He is the man who is Lord. He's the one who drank the cup of the wrath of the Lord on our behalf, that we might be saved. Now the disciples had fleeting glimpses of his glory during the time they spent with him. But a day will come when it will be on full display and it will be undeniable. Imagine uh, standing before that bench. There's the bench of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. There's all the Supreme Court judges in their robes and their horsehair wigs. It'd be pretty daunting, wouldn't it? A big scene of authority and power. But when Jesus comes in glory and all the angels with him, he's not going to need all of them. There'll be that one person on that throne. Every human court will fade from view on that day. God has fixed a day. Paul told uh, the Athenians, the, the people of Athens in Acts chapter 17, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man who he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. See, Jesus is not just the master who has returned at last that we read about last week. He's not the bridegroom who's been delayed but has finally uh, arrived. He's the king. He's the one who will execute judgment. And that judgment will be the judgment of God. He is the glorious one before whom every single one of us must give an account. In a month of pride revelers, it's actually Christians are the true revelers, reveling in the intimacy we have with Jesus the King, the Judge, the Son of Man, who calls us friend, who gives us his spirit, who brings us to his Father. If you are a Christian brother or sister, never lose sight of that. Our saviour is our judge. But given his glorious identity, it does mean he can't be treated lightly. He shouldn't be spoken of flippantly. He shouldn't be treated casually. And I say, if you don't yet know Jesus as your saviour and Lord, as your king who is the judge then you need to join me for Explore. 9 o'clock here tomorrow morning, uh, 7.30 Thursday night here. If you can't make either of those, come and talk to me after the service. We'll work something out. So that's the judge. The next question is, 
What's the nature of the judgment? Uh, There's three things I think to notice about the judgment he delivers. The first thing is it's universal. Verse 32. uh, All the nations are gathered before him, everybody. No one is outside Jesus' jurisdiction. And so that means being universal, it means judgment's inescapable. No matter what your status, no matter what your pedigree, no matter what your record of achievement, whether you're expecting it or not, whether you've acknowledged his authority or not, universal, inescapable, no exceptions. All will be gathered to stand before him. And we need to remember the scope of that day. We need to impress it on others. There is no way around this judgment day. Each one of us will stand there. Each one of us will enter that court. That's a simple fact that should make a world of difference to how we live now and a world of difference to the decisions we make each day. It's universal and it's also settled. It's a settled judgment. Did you notice, as I read the passage, without deliberation, without effort, there's no three days of you in trial on the dock and then another three weeks of calling witnesses back and forth. No, no, Jesus just separates. One on his right and one group on his left. See, he's delivering a judgment, not conducting a trial. The verdict has been decided. Those on his right, verse 34 says, they're called blessed by my father. Blessed by my father. They're told the kingdom they've inherited has been prepared for them since the creation of the world. But those on his left, verse 41, they're addressed as cursed. And straight away, they're told to depart. Where? Depart where? Into the eternal fire prepared for the devils and his angels. On that day, which side you're sent to won't be up for debate. There won't be any negotiations. There'll be no plea bargains. Don't think you can go making a deal with God on that day. It will be too late. It's interesting. Did you notice, as Jesus describes this judgment scene, none of those either on his left or on his right, none of them questioned where they'd been placed? This is a universal judgment. It's a settled judgment. And it's a Jesus-centred judgment. It's a judgment which focuses on how each one of us has related to Jesus. Whether you're on the right or the left, it's how you've treated Jesus. That is the issue. So follow with me as I read again from verse 35. I was hungry, said Jesus, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. The issue is very clearly each person's relationship to Jesus. How you treated me, Jesus, is the telling factor. How you relate to me, says Jesus, is what matters. And that's the very point where both groups are surprised. As I said, no one's, the groups aren't surprised about which side they're sent to. No protest, no attempt to negotiate, no claim that they really belong on the other side. Their question is, well, when did we see you? It's in verse 37 and verse verse 44. When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and didn't minister to you? And Jesus gives a very simple answer. It comes in verse 40 and verse 45 in two slightly different ways. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. He says to those on the right... And to the left, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. See, the unspectacular, ordinary behaviour of how we treat one another turns out to be massively significant. The guy we call the Apostle Paul, who was known as Saul of Tarsus, he had to learn on the road to Damascus. 
that it was actually Jesus himself that he was persecuting. Uh, Paul was going around beating up on Christians, arresting them and putting them in jail. Jesus appears to Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? To that point in his life, as far as we know, Saul had had no contact with Jesus. Jesus had already risen again to heaven. Uh, It was pretty hard to have contact with him and be persecuting him physically at that time. But what Saul had been doing was persecuting the church. And Jesus says to persecute the church is to persecute me. That's how strongly Jesus identifies with his people. And it's not just the leaders, is it? Not just the impressive one, not just the giants of faith, but the least of these. The entirely unimpressive ones, those that don't seem to matter, those who don't have it all together. It's any and all of those who belong to him. How Jesus' followers are treated, how you treat Jesus' followers, is a powerful indicator of how you are treating Jesus. Now, make sure your first thoughts at the moment are about how you treat Jesus' followers. Not how someone else has been treating you. How are you treating Jesus' followers? You might want to tick through. How am I going with serving, attending church, attending Bible study, being involved in their lives? That's the, they're, they're the starting points. Now, as Jesus explains this scene, those on either side didn't realise that what they were doing or not doing had been done to Jesus. That's what surprised them. They thought they were just dealing with people. But they're actually dealing with Jesus, the judge, the king, the saviour. And the faith that is the proper way to relate to Jesus cannot help but spill over into how we treat those who are his. You've heard people talk, you touch my kids, I'll break your neck. It's that idea, isn't it? You cannot claim to love Jesus and close your heart to the need of those who are precious to him. And it'll be shown in the final judgment. And how we've treated them, that's the evidence, the demonstration of how we relate to Jesus. Now, there are other places in the Gospel and the New Testament will talk about our responsibility to the needy full stop, whoever they are. A, A proper Christian concern and commitment to the most vulnerable, whoever they are, is very clear through this through the New Testament. And it's been a distinctive mark of the Christian movement right from the beginning. I don't know when Oxfam was started, but but basically Oxfam was the first ever charity in the world that wasn't started by Christians. They've all been Christian driven. The neighbour who is simply the needy person we come across, whoever they are, wherever they are, is not someone against whom we can harden our heart. But the same Paul who learned the lesson of Jesus' identification with those who follow him would write to the Galatians... In Galatians chapter 6, did I forget to put that in? Oh, that's hopeless of me. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, turn to page 1172 if you've got a church Bible. That might be why I didn't put it in. Um, Because it's good to look up. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and note this, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Our character is we want to do good to all. The priority is the household of faith. Christians awaiting the day of judgment must nurture and develop uh, a soft hardness towards those in need wherever they might be. So how we treat the homeless on the streets of Penrith, how we treat those at either end of life, they matter. How we treat the chronically ill or the disabled matters. How we treat those struggling for the most basic elements of life, how we treat each of them matters. 
But here in Matthew 25, Jesus draws particular attention to the connection that he has with even the least of these, my brothers and sisters. The significance of how we treat Jesus' people. So sign up for all the aid programs you like. But if you, if you do not see, if you refuse to see the need of even the least of my brothers and sisters, you've missed the point of what Jesus is saying here. So the final point, the outcome of his judgment. It's right there at the beginning of each interaction. We're back on page 994 if you're in the church Bibles, back in Matthew 25. Verse 34, Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. To those on his left, verse 41, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, And then like all good bits of uh, preaching or writing, a summary at the end, verse 46, then those on the left will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Very stark, isn't it? Black and white as can be. The kingdom or eternal fire? Eternal punishment or eternal life? This is not, they're not alternatives to be taken lightly. Judgment is serious. It's something we need to be prepared for because the end result of the judgment is so serious. Now, we don't tend, I don't think, to have too much trouble speaking about the joy of life in God's kingdom, of looking forward to the kingdom that we're going to inherit, the kingdom that's been prepared for us since the foundation of the world. It's something glorious held out for us. It's something wonderful anticipated by us Christians. It's an incentive to endure when there's struggles in life as we actively wait for that day. That is the thing that God has prepared for us. knowing that that glory uh, that awaits, outshines the sufferings of the present. Yet if we're uncomfortable with talking about judgment, you know, we actually get even more uncomfortable when it comes to speaking about hell. The language here in the passage of the outcome of the judgment is truly frightening. And it's deliberately so. And it's the same throughout the New Testament. Paul will speak about the wrath to come when he writes to the Thessalonians. Jesus will speak of hell as a place where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. It is terrible. Terrible picture. A reality to be avoided at all costs. costs. And that, I take it, is why Jesus tells us about it now. The disciples wanted to know, when, Jesus, will you come in glory? That's what kicked off this final public sermon. And Jesus' answer to them has been very clear. My coming is certain. So certain that you need to be ready for it now. So certain that it should shape the way you behave now. So certain it should shape the decisions you make now. And being ready, being ready for the one we've been waiting for will show itself in a number of ways. It will show itself in how we discharge the responsibilities entrusted to us. How we use the resources God has placed in our hands but not least in how we respond to our brother and sister in need. It's certainly not wrong to look forward to the final judgment as a day of reckoning that tyrants like Vladimir Putin will have to face their Jews. They won't get away with it. A right and proper judgment will be given and the judgment we all long for will be on display for all to see. But it will be a judgment not just about those big things. The judgment takes in those seemingly small everyday acts. 
towards our brothers and sisters in need. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this announcement of the judgment to come, the seriousness of its outcome, the warning of how we might prepare, not least in reminding us of the significance of the way that we treat each other, especially those brothers and sisters we know in need. Please keep us from hardening our hearts generally to the need in the world, but especially to need amongst your people. Help us to be those who so relate to Jesus that we love those who are his. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.